Hi, everybody. I am here at the New England Quilt Museum with curator Pam Weeks. Howdy, howdy. Hi. And we're going to take a look in their Donahue Gallery. I don't know why I said that so weird. Donahue Gallery. And um, they have, let's see the book. They have an exhibit here that mirrors the Whitney. Um, this was the International Quilt Museum's recent exhibition of the 50th anniversary. Let's see your face. Oh, my face. She's trying to hide behind. <laughs> ah. But uh, so they have an exhibition here that is mirroring that exhibition. So we're going to take a look at those quilts that would have. Hi, Joe. Ha who's. Hi. <laughs> All right. Let's turn the camera around and right. uh, Pam's going to tell us about Sneak it. Sneak right in. We're going to have a talk. We'll see. There we go. All and right. there's my friend Julia, our friend Julia. Hey. Hi. All right. Hi, Anne. Okay. Woo. So the Donahue Gallery is named after one of our major benefactors, Nancy Donahue. And whatever's going on in the rest of the museum, we have a special exhibit here. Laura Lane is our collections manager, and she's absolutely brilliant with either a commemorative mini exhibit like this, or she relates what's going on in the Donahue to whatever exhibit is out here. So the 50th anniversary of this exhibit at the Whitney was seminal for making people understand that quilts, although made for the bed, can be considered art. Yes. And they, they chose um, quilts, uh, Gail Vanderhoof and um, Jonathan Holstein chose quilts that they had collected in, in, I think mostly around the Pennsylvania area, if I remember correctly, but also across New England. Um, that were just visually striking. And Laura uh, took the catalog and went through it and chose quilts from our collection that are similar to what appear in the catalog. Would you like to start over here with the log cabin, Tara? Yes, absolutely. All right, so I took a minute and I marked the pages in the book. This is a quilt in our collection that was made, uh, we're not sure where, uh, but it is a gorgeous 1930s log cabin variation. And, ta-da, it's, it's so close. It's so to similar. It appeared in the Whitney exhibition in the um, Vanderhoof and Holstein collection. While we're standing right here, let's do the four patch. <coughs> this quilt is as close as we could come to the four patch with sashing that was in the exhibit. And I love this quilt because it's part of a 10 quilt donation from the Reese family. <clears throat> and this is the last generation of three generations of quilters. We have the maker's great grandmother's quilt, grandmother's quilt, made in about the 1820s to his quilt. And it was a male maker. His name <coughs> was Lewis Edson Frost. He pieced it with his mother and she finished it in time for his wedding. We have a schoolhouse or old home in a garden maze quilt, <coughs> which is circa 1900. And the corresponding quilt in the catalog looks quite a bit different, but it's still a house quilt. Very, very popular pattern over many, many years. And this one is a wonderful example of fabrics from the turn of the um, 19th into the 20th century with morning prints, with red and white prints, and of course the always present double pinks that you see in so many quilts from this period. The set in this quilt is pretty unusual. I don't think I've ever seen a schoolhouse with a garden maze set before great collection of fabrics. She kind of took some trouble arranging the colors. If you can pan way out, Tara. <clears throat> she did put the uh, the red, the four red blocks in. It's not really a medallion. Maybe if there was one more row of houses, it would have been a medallion. Oh, yeah. Then looky what we have here. Those Oh, are you still on I was the just pointing out those four red ones there in case yep. anyone was taking a minute to locate those. Got it. Hi, Victoria. Hi, Cindy. Hi, guys. 
So they included many Amish quilts. I don't know if that's going to show up on your camera at all. Can you see the bars? A little bit, yeah. There yeah. we go. Mm -hmm. We have a wonderful bars crib quilt if you want to march over there and put your nose on that one. Put my nose on it? Well, no, I won't I'll let you put your nose on it. That's my, that's my word for getting close to it. Yeah. This is part of the, uh, the Binnie collection. My full title is Binnie Family Curator because the Binnie family was so generous in donating, uh, I think we're more than 30 quilts now. And this is from the, um, the Binnie collection. And I think we're dating it very early. <clears throat> Yeah, 1825. I don't think it's quite that early. I think we need to revisit the, the fabric ID on this one. Maybe 1840s? Uh, 1840s or 50s, I think, is fair. Is that green? Yeah. Now, on the bed, we have um, a, is it Amish or Mennonite? I should have looked at these labels first. It, it was collected in Pennsylvania, maker unknown. We're dating this one circa 1910 to 1930. Um, Vanderhoof and, and Holstein um, included many different log cabin variations in their mm -hmm. um, in their exhibit, and this is a really stunning one, especially when it's hanging. We chose to put it on the bed because we had it out pretty recently, but those little red squares just pop across the surface. They do. I love the the way the stripe plays in those logs. Yes. Straights and furrows, right? Straight That's furrows. the setting? Yep, the, the, the uh, setting is straight furrows. And again, it's just so bold with the dark green and the dark indigo. And then that funny striped fabric that does wonderful wonky things. All right, take a close up of the wild goose chase from the catalog. Mm -hmm. And then have a look at the crib quilt in our collection which is also wild goose chase, but in ours, the geese are all going in the same direction. Um, Shirley Weinberg is the donor of this piece, another person whose generosity enhanced our collection. Uh, we're dating this one 1850. It's slightly faded. Some of the reds are, are going off a little bit, but they're gorgeous turkey reds and yeah. um, some lovely light and dark fabrics to contrast and double pink again. But you know, not very much of it, only in those two stripes. Just a little bit, yeah. yeah. So curators aren't supposed to have favorites. But I think if I had a favorite in this room, it would be the Tree Everlasting. It is pretty dynamic. Holstein calls this pattern from the catalog, Tree Everlasting. I think we have a different name for it. And again, this is from the Vinnie collection. Um, Path of Thorns is the title for this that came along with it. Huh. But when you have a second, um, Tara, come right in because the quilting on the blue bands is just extraordinary. It's one, two, oh. three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, 11 rows of tiny little quilting. Yeah, put your finger in there so folks can have something to reference the size. And then tiny, in the white tiny. bands, they're just these incredible feathered bands. Beautifully done. I had Julia come in and have a look because I've been going back and forth with Laura about whether that was a very fine wool in the indigo, but she's finally convinced me that it's cotton. Yeah, our friend Julia, who, um, if you joined us early, I'll give you a little shot. Hi, Julia. Hi, darling. Okay. <laughs> Julia is quite the expert on some early pieces, so it's good to have friends. And what did I do with the railroad <laughs> So this thing to your right, I call it this thing because, <laughs> as Julia said when she saw it, the maker of that never thought it would end up in a museum. <laughs> And if you want to, um, we're getting better at showing pattern sources. Oh, this quilt yeah. was made in the 1940s, and it may have been made from the Crossroads pattern that was published in the newspaper. I think the, um, the quilt that they used in their exhibit yeah. was a little bit earlier, but the pattern is the same. So here's interesting, too, is the pattern focuses on the crossroads, obviously crossroads, right. but the crossing of those almost sashing strips, it looks like in that, 
But if you look at the quilt, really what you see are the circles and crosses. Yes. And or at least that's what I see first. And here's their quilt. Yeah. I think they call it circles and crosses, don't they? They do. Yeah. But it's the closest that we had from our collection, and I think it's pretty cool. Absolutely. Ugly, but cool. No. Oh, did I say that? You didn't no, say that. Didn't <gasps> say that. <laughs> you wouldn't say that, Pam. <laughs> did for folks is she photocopied those pages that we were just showing you from the catalog. And then um, we have this wonderful bureau that was a gift of Carrie Bresenham at Quilts Inc. And Laura um, threw in an Ocean Waves quilt, which is in the catalog. Oh, I just love an Ocean Waves. Do you? I won't, oh. I won't slam it shut quite yet then. Yeah. 1870s. Oh, that's beautiful. 1880s. That, that, uh, black and red combination that you don't see until the 1880s. Yeah. And in this drawer, we have a grape basket quilt top. Holstein included a couple of really interesting basket quilts. Let me see if I can find one quickly. The one that caught me was the one of the baskets just floating in the air with no <laughs> base. So fill that with blueberries and put it down and see how far they scale. <laughs> it's more like a spinning top. There we go. <laughs> But that's a nice um, basket top that we have in our collection. Yeah. Uh, circa 1880. This one is a double X quilt, which Ooh. is also from the Reese family collection of the four patch that we showed over here. Mm -hmm. This was made by um, Lewis's grandmother, Vincy Ann Miller Birdsey. I should have thought I have a picture of her in my office. Next time. Next time. This is a bit earlier, circa 1865. Very graphic quilt. And then in the bottom drawer, we have a Jacob's Ladder, which is a very New England looking thing to me, circa 1910. I'll bet his Jacob's Ladder was an Amish quilt. Let me get that glare from the window. Let me get yeah. on this side. Not easy. We're very lucky to have been uh, to be a museum in an old bank building, but the windows can be a challenge sometimes. It's a spectacular location, though. It's we like it. Um, we think this was a conference room. This little gallery. I'm not finding it, but I think folks get the idea. Yeah. I'm just gonna give a yeah, another. Yeah, pan, pan right around. This gallery um, changes out every, we have four to, four to six exhibits per year, depending on what's going on in the other galleries. And Laura is just brilliant at putting together really interesting things. That's wonderful. And we are going to, not in this live session, but we are, Pam and I, going to take a look at the rest of what's happening on here right now. We have quarantine quilts. We have um, works from children's book illustrator Sally Mavor. And in our genre gallery, we have a fabulous exhibit of the work of Laura Petrovich Cini, who makes wood quilts. Should we do that one live? Yeah. Let's do that one live. And the, we're going to save the others. I'm going to turn this around now. Okay, so we're going to go in and do the um, wood quilts in a minute. Let's take a five-minute break. Yeah. And uh, then we'll do the rest of these, film it for Quilt District on the Road on YouTube. And uh, we'll meet you guys back here in just a few minutes. Before or after lunch? Oh, should we eat? Nah. Let's food. do quilts. Let's do quilts. <laughs> Who needs food? <laughs> we have chocolate. <laughs> we'll be fine. And coffee. And coffee. <laughs> You can tell because we're both chitter. Yeah. Okay. Uh, four or five minutes. We'll be right back. Oh, I got to stop it. <laughs>